Uh, and good evening for all my Indian colleagues. Uh, thanks to Sun Pharma and uh, uh, for all the participants uh, who are there. I hear that there are more than 1,300 registrants for this conference. And uh, on behalf of Sky, uh, we have uh, Dr. Cindy Grimes uh, from uh, Atlanta and Dr. Tim Henry from Ohio and Dr. Sunil Rao from uh, Duke and as well as myself. Uh, we are uh, happy to uh, air this webinar for the benefit of all of our uh, cardiology colleagues in India. And uh, the title is actually ACC 2020 uh, Clinical Trials, uh, How to Apply Them to Your Clinical Practice. And uh, with that, uh, I also thank uh, Sky and uh, Sun Pharma for the sponsoring this program. Thank you very much. And we'll move on first to our uh, first speaker. But before that, a little bit of, uh, please make sure you mute your mic so that uh, there's no uh, back chatter or uh, echoing. And if you have any questions, please keep on sending them and we'll answer your questions in the uh, uh, QA session. Uh, we have uh, slated about 10 to 15 minutes for discussion at the end of each trial. Thank you very much. And uh, let's go ahead with uh, Dr. Sunil Rao from Duke. Great. Thanks, uh, Ramesh, and thanks to everybody in India for joining us. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, secondary prevention after lower extremity revascularization. Uh, if, um, so I don't have any disclosures related to this. I do receive research funding uh, from a variety of industry partners. Um, so if we can just have the slides put up so I can see them. Great, thanks. So I'll start this with a case presentation because I think it's always important to put these clinical trial results into clinical context. So this is a patient that we took care of a few months ago. It's a 72-year-old male who had a history of coronary artery disease, had bypass surgery in 2012, obviously had many of the risk factors that we're familiar with, type 2 diabetes, hyperlipidemia, former smoking, also had carotid endarterectomy, and he presents now with lower extremity claudication. So this is a patient who has what we term polyvascular disease. He has coronary disease, cerebrovascular disease, and now clear clinical evidence of peripheral arterial disease. He's currently maintained on aspirin and clopidogrel, which I think has been the standard for patients with this type of syndrome, uh, a statin, ACE inhibitor, as well as insulin for his diabetes. His exam clearly shows that he has a problem in the right lower extremity with an ABI of 0.6, he had a peripheral angiography that showed a right lower extremity SFA CTO that was successfully crossed and ballooned. Uh, there was a pretty large dissection, uh, which we were worried about becoming exclusive, uh, exclusive. So we went ahead and stented it. So the question I think after this lower extremity revascularization is how do we reduce this patient's long-term risk of major adverse cardiac events, what we call MACE, and then major adverse limb events, which is called male. Now, male may be a term that you're not necessarily familiar with, but it's becoming very uh, important for us to think about limb events as well in patients with peripheral arterial disease. So this is where the Voyager PAD trial comes in. This was presented at the American College of Cardiology meeting a few weeks ago and published simultaneously in the New England Journal. Next slide. It was uh, sponsored by Bayer and Janssen. Next slide. The background of this is that the risk in patients undergoing peripheral revascularization remains very, very high. There are acute events, and then there are long-term events during the so-called stable phase. And what you can see is that the events continue to occur in these very high-risk patients. If you actually look at what these outcomes are, 4% of them will actually die at the time of presentation with their peripheral arterial disease. These are mostly patients who have evidence of gangrene, for example. 20% have major amputations. I live in the southern part of the United States, which is the amputation belt. The rates of amputation in our area is, are very, very high. Uh, about a third will have prolonged ICU stay, and 75% will require some type of major surgery, usually some type of major vascular surgery. So the outcomes after hospitalization are very, very poor. If you aggregate them together, about 15% of them will be either disabled or dead. Next slide. The problem, of course, is that our pharmacological therapies have not worked in the past. We used to think of PAD as similar to coronary disease. In other words, it was a platelet-based phenomenon. But we know that dual antiplatelet therapy with aspirin clopidogrel doesn't work. It's associated with increased bleeding, no benefit. We know that full dose oral anticoagulation doesn't work either because of an increased risk of hemorrhagic stroke. We even tried more potent antiplatelet therapy in the Euclid trial with Ticagalor. Many of you may have participated in that trial. That also did not seem to work. So we need new therapies. Next slide. So the objectives of the Voyager PAD trial was to build on the results of the COMPASS trial. So COMPASS, remember, showed that low-dose rivaroxaban, 
reduced adverse cardiovascular events in a high-risk secondary prevention population with a concentrated effect in patients who had peripheral arterial disease. So this was building on that and testing whether rivaroxaban at two and a half milligrams twice daily, so low dose, added to low dose aspirin reduced the risk of MACE and male compared with aspirin alone. And then of course the secondary objectives were to assess the safety of this strategy. Next slide. This is the trial design, very simple, large trial, 6,500 patients with symptomatic lower extremity PAD who had undergone lower extremity revascularization, very similar to what the type of patient that I just presented to you. All the patients had a minimum of aspirin, 100 milligrams daily. Clopidogrel could be used at the operator's discretion, and they were randomized one-to-one in a double-blind fashion to rivaroxaban, two and a half milligrams twice daily versus placebo. Uh, it was an event-driven trial that determined the sample size. The primary efficacy endpoint was a composite of acute limb ischemia, major amputation of vascular etiology, myocardial infarction, ischemic stroke, or cardiovascular death. So a five-component composite endpoint. Primary safety outcome was TIMI major bleeding. As I'll show you, other bleeding indices were assessed as well. Here are the inclusion criteria. The patients had to have documented PAD and be over the age of 60. Multiple exclusions, as you can imagine, recent revascularization, major tissue loss, because that suggests that the patient needs amputation, um, need for long-term DAPD, for example, if they had coronary disease and had recently underwent a stent, and of course, high risk for bleeding. Next slide. The outcomes, as I mentioned to you, uh, the primary was a five-component composite, and then safety endpoints, a principal outcome was Timmy major bleeding, but they also looked at ISTH definitions as well as BARC uh, type 3B or above. Next slide. I'm, not, I'm gonna buzz through these baseline characteristics, really no significant difference between the two arms, as you can imagine, very high risk population uh, with 40% uh, diabetics. Next slide. Here are the procedural characteristics. Again, the, the, these are not gonna be important. We're not gonna spend a lot of time on this. Suffice it to say that the vast majority of these patients had a history of claudication, similar to the patient that I mentioned. Uh, about 6% had a history of other amputation. So again, pretty high risk patient population. The ankle brachial index in these patients was very low, 0.5, and about uh, 24 to 29% of these patients had critical limb ischemia. The vast majority of the patients underwent endovascular revascularization. Some of them also had surgical revascularization. Next slide. So here's the primary endpoint in the placebo group, 20%. Again, as we expected, very high rate of, uh, of, of MACE and male at 36 months. Next slide. And here is the effect of the treatment. So you can see a very significant reduction, uh, over 2%, reduction in the primary endpoint with the addition of low-dose rivaroxaban to background therapy. Next slide. The important thing here is that, yes, there was a 15% reduction overall. Next. But you can see, um, go ahead, hit next, please. Yeah, if you hit one more time, you can see what's important here is that the curves, sorry, go back one more slide. Yeah, the curves kept diverging. So the benefit was early on, and then it, the benefit continued to increase over time with a number needed to treat uh, of only 39 to prevent one of these primary endpoint events. Next slide. The primary endpoint and its components, the important issue here is that almost all of the uh, events here directionally favored therapy with the, exception, with the exception of cardiovascular death, which again did not meet statistical significance The trial was not powered for that. Uh, but the major components of this composite endpoint certainly do show that there's a benefit of rivaroxaban added to background therapy. The death signal is interesting. I imagine that we'll see some more um, evaluation of that particular signal. Again, not statistically significant. Interesting directionally th that it favored the, uh, the placebo endpoint. And it'll be interesting to find out if that's a real signal or if that's just noise. Next slide. What about uh, other secondary outcomes? You can see that all of the, uh, the secondary outcomes were favored here, depending on which combination that you look at, uh, including, interestingly, uh, venous thromboembolism. Now, we know that uh, anticoagulation helps with that. This is very, very low dose, also seemed to show a benefit. Again, not statistically significant, very robust, but uh, certainly a directionally benefit uh, reduction in VTE. Next slide. What about safety? So obviously, if we're going to add an, uh, an anticoagulant on top of background therapy, we are going to expect increased bleeding. That is certainly what was seen there, an increase in Timmy major bleeding. It did not meet statistical significance, but directionally, you would expect an increase. What's important, though, is uh, what's in the middle here, and that is there's no increase in intracranial hemorrhage. We would worry about that, obviously. Um, then there's no increase in fatal hemorrhage, So, and very, very low rates of fatal hemorrhage. 0.2% in both arms, 
you know, when I saw that death signal, I thought, geez, is this because of increased bleeding? Certainly, there does not seem to be an increase in bleeding directly related to bleeding complications. So I, I suspect that the death signal really is noise more than anything else. What about other uh, scales, bark 3 b or greater, ISTH major? Yes, there is an increase in bleeding complications using both of these scales. Not unexpected when you add an anticoagulant, even at low dose on top of background therapy. Next slide. So this is a, a, a way of putting together these results into sort of more of a clinical or practical context. These are events prevented over cause for 10,000 patients treated per year. Why 10,000? It's just an easy way of looking at this. This is an incredibly common disease. So 10,000 patients certainly is, is a reasonable denominator. And you can see that for the primary efficacy outcome, you would prevent you know, uh, uh, over 100 events um, with uh, the addition of rivaroxaban. Uh, certainly for other things like amputations, myocardial infarction, ischemic stroke, directionally favoring uh, the addition of rivaroxaban at the expense of 29 increased major bleeding events defined according to the Timmy scale. No increase in anterior hemorrhage, no increase in fatal bleeding. Next slide. So in, the summary of this is that in symptomatic patients after revascularization, about one in five have acute limb ischemia, major amputation, and other adverse events. In this population, in this setting, rivaroxaban two and a half milligrams twice daily with aspirin compared with aspirin alone, next slide, significantly reduces the risk with benefits that are apparent early and continued, in fact, expanding over time, consistent benefit across major subgroups. I didn't show you the uh, subgroup data because it, it really is directionally all the same. Broad benefits, including reductions in unplanned index re limb revascularization. Next slide. There is an increase in bleeding in Voyager PAD, a numerical increase in Timmy major bleeding, statistically significant increase in ISTH, uh, but no excess in intracranial or fatal bleeding. Next slide. And it prevents six times as many ischemic events relative to bleeds caused in PAD patients after revascularization. Great, thanks very much. Um, Ramesh, do you wanna do questions now or do you wanna wait till the end? If you have time, Sunil, we could go ahead and do the questions now. Yeah, there is one question, which I think is an interesting one, which is why not five milligrams once daily, since we use that once daily dose to prevent antithrombotic events? It's a great question. And all I can tell you is that in the, um, in the COMPASS trial, the strategy was to use the twice a day strategy with two and a half milligrams. It may have something to do with the pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics of the drug, I don't know. Um, but this, since this really was derived from the benefits seen in COMPASS, uh, I think that's the reason that they use this strategy. I think one of the challenges with um, rivaroxaban is the dosing. You know, this is a drug that appears to be beneficial across multiple antithrombotic or, or thrombo atherothrombotic states, including venous thromboembolism, but you have to pay attention to the dosing and, and it can get very, very confusing. So that is a challenge with rivaroxaban, certainly in the setting of secondary prevention, uh, so not in the acute myocardial infarction stage, but in the secondary prevention setting, the two and a half milligrams twice daily seems to be a reasonable approach. So um, then I, I, have, I have another question, you know, because a lot of our physicians from India, I'm sure would like to ask that, can't we do the same with maybe warfarin one milligram or uh, two milligrams a day? Yeah, so it's a good question. Um, you know, the data, as I showed you early on, was that the oral anticoagulation studies with warfarin were not beneficial in PAD. And I think building on that question is another really good question. Normally, we, someone asks, well, normally we give two antiplatelet agents in all patients undergoing peripheral intervention. In this study, very few patients were on dual antiplatelet therapy. How do we interpret the results? I think it's a great question. There was a presentation uh, uh, subsequent to the main presentation that looked at the interaction with clopidogrel, and it did not seem to minimize or diminish the beneficial effects of rivaroxaban on top of clopidogrel. It is important to realize that the strategy of dual antiplatelet therapy in peripheral uh, vascular disease has not been consistently beneficial. If, if anything, the effect is very, very modest. Um, so, but it does seem in this trial, the small number of patients that were treated with clopidogrel, they seem to garner the same benefit, again, with the same risk of an increased risk of bleeding when you add rivaroxaban. So one other question is that, uh, as we know, every antiplatelet agent trial shows that there is a benefit of 2% you know, whether it is uh, cyclopidin versus aspirin and then clopidogrel on top of uh, aspirin and then uh, ticagrelor, then oprasigrel. Every, if you take the placebo, I mean, the uh, control arm versus the test arm, there's a 2% difference. 
how does that two percent difference because you are trialist i'm asking you is calculated do we always expect to show that two percent difference and change the sample size or is it just yeah. natural so this is a great question and i, I think this really goes towards trial design more than anything else uh, I, I think that the strategy generally is to expect about a 15% relative risk reduction. That's usually what's considered the benchmark because that's what the FDA uh, has, has traditionally seen as something that's approvable. So 15% is what we aim for. Sometimes we get surprised when you see a 19% or 20% relative risk reduction, which can translate to a 2% absolute reduction. But again, we have to be careful not to translate the effects of the coronary trials into the peripheral space. If there's something that we've learned over the last five years, they're really not the same disease. How many patients are on triple therapy? Yeah, it's a good question. I don't know the answer to that off the top of my head. I can certainly look it up for people. That was, like I said, it was a subsequent presentation to this one. It was not a lot of patients, really. It was a relatively low number uh, because, again, um, the one of the exclusions was the need for prolonged DAPT that likely was interpreted as any patient on DAPT for, for many sites. But we can certainly get that information. Uh, another great question, maybe this will be, will be the last question before we move on to the next presentation, is um, uh, would you expect the same outcomes with other NOACs? Terrific question. Um, I think, uh, you know, it's interesting, this whole issue of class effect. We tend to think of class effects when it comes to efficacy and yet are reluctant to think about class effects when it comes to safety. I don't know the answer to whether we would expect to see it with other NOACs. We might be expected to see it with other factor 10A inhibitors. I'm not sure that we're going to see it with a factor 2A inhibitor like dabigatran. Again, I think what we're learning about PAD is that it's not like coronary disease and that uh, we probably need to have other strategies. I don't think apixaban is going to be studied in this setting. Um, so for now, I would recommend people stick with the agent that's been studied, which is rivaroxaban. Uh, and uh, propodogrel rather than aspirin. Yeah, well, remember, uh, in this trial, it was aspirin that was the background therapy. So these data suggest that it's uh, rivaroxaban plus aspirin. Clopidogrel, uh, for some period of time, because the patient has undergone a uh, revascularization, if that's something that people feel comfortable with. But again, the vast majority of these patients were treated in the treatment arm with rivaroxaban plus aspirin alone. Thank you very much, uh, Sunil. I appreciate your presentation. and. Uh... Uh, you know, we all are excited uh, about uh, this new trial that has come out and uh, this uh, speaks highly about uh, how to treat uh, limb salvage uh, or reduce uh, uh, limb events in uh, peripheral arterial disease. Thank you very much. Uh, one, I think, uh, Sunil, you're still here. One, uh, one question about the bleeding incidents. Uh, do you think that there is more bleeding in the uh, arm and uh, how do you want to address that? Oh, I, I don't think there's any question that there's more bleeding in that arm. You're adding an anticoagulant on top. There's a question about how long should we treat. The trial treated for 36 months. So that's how long I would treat. I, I tend to be a purist when it comes to these things. Um, but certainly these patients are at risk for bleeding. They're at risk for subsequent surgeries. So you may have to stop in a certain proportion of these patients. Thank you. In view of time, we'll move on to the next presentation. I think actually the next presentation is uh, uh, by me. So I think one of the questions while the slides come up actually is about COVID-19, what is the best uh, therapy, medicine? Uh, unfortunately, uh, we uh, are faced with the COVID-19 much more than any other country has so far. Mortality is very high. There is no single medical therapy that is working, mostly supportive therapy. So with that, uh, let's go to the current uh, 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 slide. And we will have a COVID session next week, so please join us on that, uh, COVID with the cardiovascular disease. And uh, can you see my slides? And uh, so we are going to talk about iotic stenosis uh, and uh, uh, transcatheter iotic. Please, next slide. So I want to start off with a case presentation here. Uh, is an 82-year-old gentleman with uh, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, former smoker, severe symptomatic aortic stenosis with uh, class 2 New York Heart Association dyspnea on exertion. His echocardiogram showed uh, LV ejection fraction, which is preserved at 55%, a valve area of 0.7, and mean gradient of 41. So the question is, uh, how do we do this procedure in this patient, and should we always look at the uh, 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 the SPS risk score and uh, whether we should address uh, 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 the patient for surgery or what, what should be done because he is uh, 82 years old and otherwise he is uh, in a 
falls into a low risk category with the SDS risk score of actually about a 2.8 percent. And uh, so, but this patient was uh, seen by surgeons in our office, uh, hospital, and uh, uh, we took him to uh, the cath lab to do a transcatheter aortic valve replacement. As you can see in the first slide, we were able to cross uh, the aortic valve with an AL1 uh, uh, catheter and a straight uh, tipped uh, wire. And uh, then we exchanged that for a pigtail catheter. We observed uh, the gradients, which were very high, about 41 millimeters. And then we implanted uh, an S3 valve in the uh, slide, slide just below that. And on the right side, you can see after implantation of the transcatheter aortic valve uh, with the uh, uh, 23 millimeter sapient valve, there was no uh, aortic regurgitation. And uh, below that, you can see the hemodynamics, which are very good and uh, show that uh, there is, uh, in fact, uh, there's no gradient at all. So this procedure was done under general anesthesia with the TE guidance and uh, femoral axis. Two per close sutures were placed prior to you know, insertion of the large uh, board catheter. Uh, and then uh, successful TAV uh, patient was extubated in the operating room and he was discharged from next. So uh, with that, I'll uh, discuss the UK TAVI trial, which was presented at the uh, ACC uh, by uh, Dr. Toft. And uh, a UK TAVI was uh, done at the, around the same time uh, as the low risk trials were ongoing in the United States and other centers. So in background, transcatheter aortic valve implantation is a less invasive alternative to conventional surgical aortic valve replacement. The previous trials had been shown to be non-inferior to surgery in high-risk patients, and trials, as I mentioned, in lower risk were ongoing at this time. The previous trials were focused on specific TAVI valves and explanatory rather than pragmatic in their design. With that, uh, next slide, please. Uh, the main objective is actually to show uh, the TAVI uh, versus surgery in uh, people who are symptomatic severe aortic stenosis with uh, either age more than 80 years alone or age more than 70 with uh, intermediate or high operative risk from conventional AVR as determined by the medical uh, multidisciplinary team. So that means anybody about, above 80, even irrespective of their, whether their uh, SPS risk score is one or four, they were all enrolled in this trial. And uh, so both the conventional aortic valve replacement and the TAVI deemed to be acceptable treatment options and uh, the participant was uh, able and willing to give a return informed consent and uh, he was able to comply with the study requirements. And the exclusion criteria, which I'll tell you, are uh, similar to all the other clinical trials. No, nobody on end-stage renal disease on hemodialysis and uh, or, uh, cancer or uh, survival less than uh, 12 months uh, were enrolled in this trial. Anybody who uh, uh, has metal allergy to the TAVI valves or anything of that sort also were excluded. So, People had several other comorbidities, obviously, are not uh, included in this clinical trial. Next slide, please. So the primary endpoint is all-cause mortality at one year, and the primary hypothesis is TAVI is not inferior to surgery in respect of death from any cause at one year in this uh, group of patients. Next slide. So the patients, uh, you, you can see here, the uh, patients are invited after a multidisciplinary team review and confirmation of eligibility. And uh, about 400 patients were declined to participate and uh, majority of them are randomized. 913 patients were randomized either to TAVI in the 458 uh, people received TAVI and 455 patients were allocated to surgery. And the two types of analysis done, both uh, intention to treat and for protocol analysis and uh, uh, at uh, one year between the two arms. Next slide. So the baseline characteristics here, the most important thing is the age, is a mean age of uh, uh, 81 in both the groups, which is uh, important. And as you can see, uh, about uh, two thirds and nearly 68% of them are above uh, 80 years of age. And uh, uh, more, uh, more important than uh, that actually is that there is equal distribution of uh, male to female genders in this trial, about 50% in each uh, uh, gender were included in this trial. And uh, they are obviously not uh, severely obese patients. The SPS risk score is about 2.6, and uh, class two, uh, I mean class three or four, uh, dyspnea is seen in about 40% uh, of the patients. And valve areas, as similar to my patient, is 0.7 uh, uh, plus or minus 0.2. Uh, 
and uh, the gradients were peak gradients were very high ejection fractions were preserved and as i said this is the low risk clinical trial with the lower incidence of other all other comorbidities on the right hand side that you can see and uh, pacemakers were seen in uh, about 6.8% prior to the uh, incidence of uh, prior to allocation into these uh, one of these arms next slide so majority of them were performed uh, transfemorally, about uh, 92%. Uh, I don't think we are doing any more transapical, and very rarely we are doing uh, either subclavian or uh, uh, carotid in our center. And uh, our alternate axis is uh, now actually carotids uh, other than uh, transfemoral. So, uh, and as you also see what type of uh, uh, valves were used, uh, majority of them were sapien uh, three, uh, about 45%. And uh, evolute uh, is a mixture of about uh, uh, 14 percent and uh, uh, lotus is about another 10 percent and other valves are uh, as less than that so mostly it is uh, uh, 45 percent of them have received uh, s3 and another 10 percent some type of uh, uh, sapien valve next slide so this is the primary endpoint where time to death from any cause has been shown that uh, in the cavi is in the blue and uh, uh, surgical avr is in the red and uh, so uh, death uh, is 4.6% uh, in the cavi arm versus 6.6. Again, you can see a 2% absolute uh, risk reduction with the uh, 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 cavi compared to uh, surgery. Next slide. And uh, time to first stroke as well. The, you know, as you can see in the beginning, uh, up to uh, uh, one month, there is no difference. But at the end of 12 months, uh, there is a slight difference in uh, uh, stroke, and uh, that actually probably will be something that we have to further investigate and think about uh, maybe uh, paroxysmal atrial fibrillations that might be occurring in these people uh, who have received TAVI. So we all, always have to be careful and maintain some sort of uh, uh, antiplatelet or anticoagulation in them. Next slide. So the pre-specified outcomes uh, death from any cause, as I said, is lower. And even though the uh, statistically uh, it is not significant, as uh, we see the uh, p-value is not uh, significant because of the sample size, but uh, numerically there, uh, there are different, there's a difference, and at least that we can say they are non-inferior. And bleeding rates are, uh, as you can see, much lower with the TAVI as compared to surgery. And as you know, uh, any transfusion more than two units is considered as a bleeding complication during surgery. Next slide. So though the vascular complications are slightly high, uh, the conclusion is that in patients aged uh, 70 or, or greater, severe symptomatic aortic stenosis uh, is at an increased operative risk uh, due to age and comorbidity irrespective of their uh, 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 SPS risk score. And uh, so in this study, we were able to show that TAVI is not inferior to conventional surgery in respect of death from any cause at one year. And the TAVI is associated with less major bleeding than surgery, but an increased frequency of vascular complications. The pacemaker implantations are all still, as we know that uh, it's about 15% uh, uh, with the, uh, 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 in the entire group. And uh, there is a slight difference between uh, evolute versus uh, uh, sapien in these as well. And uh, there is a mild to moderate uh, paravalvular leak that is observed, uh, which is higher in the TAVI compared to surgery. So TAVI is associated with a shorter hospital stay and more rapid improvement in the functional capacity and quality of life. And obviously longer follow-up is required to confirm sustained clinical benefit and valve durability to inform clinical practice and particularly in younger patients. And as I know, I know that in India, many people are uh, much younger and uh, maybe they even have bicuspid valves. Uh, so we do not have a uh, uh, correct uh, data on younger you know, people less than 65 years of age, what is the best modality and uh, is the TAVI the right way to do. But uh, so that is a discussion that one has to have with the patient and uh, make a, a, a conscious decision in regards to their therapy. Thank you very much. Any questions and uh, I'll be uh, able to answer and I'm also looking at any other questions that might be coming up. Uh, you know, in the meantime, I probably will ask uh, any questions from our panelists, uh, uh, Cindy or uh, Dr. Tim Henry and uh, and Sunil, if you're still on uh, online. So, um, Ramesh, do you? I mean, are these findings particularly surprising to you? 
uh, in terms of this particular study? Well, actually, no, because we are already doing it, and uh, that's exactly what I was going to say, is that uh, even the case presentation I showed you, anyone uh, in our center, at least, anyone greater than 80 years of age uh, doesn't even uh, have to have a calculation of SPS risk score. Our surgeons are, uh, go ahead and let's do uh, TAVI in this patient rather than aortic valve. One interesting thing, what we are doing in our center is actually now we have completed about 10 patients of robotic AVR in younger patients. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that is something that uh, obviously all the hardcore TAVI uh, interventional cardiologists don't actually want to think about any other sort of uh, AVR. And, uh, but this robotic AVR, we have done 10 patients. They were able to go home in uh, three days. So length of stay is also slightly shorter. And uh, we just have to wait and uh, see uh, how they fare at uh, one year. And we were trying to start a clinical, at least a single center clinical trial here. Yeah. So the, the question is the role of TAVI in aortic regurgitation. Uh, 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 currently, we are not uh, uh, addressing, uh, it can be done, but the current uh, valves that we have uh, are not in at least in the United States are not good enough for all patients with aortic regurgitation because they do not have much of calcium. If they have a, a mixed uh, valve disease that is different than a pure aortic regurgitation, those patients, uh, Yana valve, uh, uh, which is under clinical trials, is probably the best. At least that's what I hear from my European colleagues, and uh, I have no experience in that. But we did do valve in valve uh, patients uh, who had a prior surgical valve and they have severe AI, we address that with the TAVI valve that has been done. And uh, current uh, concomitant coronary artery disease, uh, we do, uh, especially in younger patients, we have to take care of their coronary artery disease uh, as well as their uh, TAVI, I mean, uh, aortic stenosis. So how we approach it, we do the uh, coronary artery disease uh, uh, PCI first, and uh, then we bring them back uh, for a uh, TAVR. And uh, in, I think in your older patients who are uh, 82 or 90 year old, uh, in them, we actually address them basically based on their symptoms. If the symptoms are not angina, then we actually leave the coronary artery alone, uh, as we know that it is more uh, uh, about the mortality benefit with the tower than a symptomatic relief from uh, PCI. So if there are no other questions, I think uh, we'll move on to the next presentation. Uh, uh, is that all right, uh, Dr. Henry? Or... Good morning. Good morning. So I want to introduce Dr. Tim Henry, who's uh, 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 the main interventional cardiologist at Ohio State. Uh, Tim uh, is going to talk about, uh, uh, he has a lot of clinical experience, and uh, he will be the uh, president of uh, Sky in a couple of years, and uh, uh, Tim, I think, uh, please introduce uh, your your presentation and uh, proceed on. Thank you. Yeah, delighted to be here this morning, and thanks for joining us. Um, I am actually at uh, the Christ Hospital in Cincinnati, and I'm, I'm uh, going to present Taylor PCI uh, or tailored antiplatelet initiation to lessen outcomes due to. De decreased clopidogrel response. Um, and this is by Dr. Pereira uh, at the Mayo Clinic. So I think this is a um, uh, really important trial for a number of reasons. Next slide, please. So what we know is that clopidogrel is still the most widely used P2Y12 inhibitor in the world. The we have two others, um, both Ticagular, which is, uh, you can see in the purple line, and then Prasagril. Um, both Ticagular and Prasagril are, have been shown to be more potent, have faster onset, and have decreased variability. So uh, theoretically, they have been more potent. And in, both in, in terms of uh, acute coronary syndrome, so non-STEMI and at STEMI, there are probably some prefer, preferred advantages to uh, the more potent P2Y12 inhibition. Next slide. One of the re main reasons for this is because what we know is that um, clopidogrel um, uh, to 
uh, depends on the activation of cytochrome P450. And in particular, the CYP uh, uh, TSA19 genotype. So patients that have this genotype have decreased effectiveness of clopidogrel. And it, when you look at uh, trials overall, uh, in general, carriers of this genotype have increased event rates. And that we've known that for 10 years. Next slide. In fact, so much so that if you can see on the left side, the clopidogrel actually carries a black box warning. And the warning says that the effectiveness of Plavix depends on activation to an active metabolite and poor metabolites uh, treated with Plavix uh, have higher event rates. On the other hand, at the same time, there was a special panel that looked through this and said, there's really no, the evidence is insufficient to recommend either routine genetic or platelet function testing at the time. So what's happened really in the last 10 years, um, we there's been really no trials that show that doing either genetic testing or platelet function testing really make a major difference. So next slide. So that really lead it to the Taylor PCI because what's happened is we have easier and less expensive uh, genetic testing. And so the trial was really is identifying patients who have loss of function of the CYP2C19 allele. Um, does that uh, and changing your P2Y12 inhibition based on that genotype decrease outcomes? Next slide. So what there was was a two-arm parallel open label international multi-center trial uh, randomized to look at superior. And it's a very uh, broad group of patients. Basically, if you're over 18, and any acute coronary syndrome or any stable coronary disease and uh, getting 12 months of DAP were allowed to be in the trial. The only exclusions is if, if you had a failure or if you had a known, if you'd already been genotyped, which is a relative small number of people, or whether you're having a planned revascularization of another vessel. So staged patients were out, but otherwise, really it's anybody we do PCI on was allowed to be in the trial. Next slide. So this is the design of the trial and it's a little bit complicated. So let's look at it. What Basically what you did is um, patients were randomized to either conventional therapy, which was with clopidogrel, or genotype guided therapy, if you look in the green. And it, what they did is uh, when they uh, looked in the uh, genotype guided, if you were actually a carrier, then you are actually uh, randomized to ticaglar uh, 90 milligrams twice a day. And then what they did at the end of 12 months, they actually did genotyping on everyone. And the primary analysis, which is I'm going to show you today, were the patients that had all of the patients that were carriers. And then looking at the patients who, with if you're a carrier, those who got ticaglar compared to those who got uh, clopidogrel. Next slide. So the primary endpoint was the composite of uh, cardiovascular death, myocardial infarction, stroke, definite or probable stent thrombosis, or severe recurrent ischemia within one year. And then the secondary endpoint was major and minor bleeding. And then they were adjudicated by a central committee. It was extremely well done trial. And I think really designed to answer the question. An important thing I don't show on the slide here now is that it, early on in the trial, they uh, determined that the event rates were relatively small in both groups. So given that the overall rent rates, they were blinded to this, but they actually changed the trial and increased the number of people enrolled in the trial. Next slide. So this is actually the final one. And if you can see here, overall, there was uh, five over 5,000 patients enrolled in the trial. And it was uh, very well balanced. And what we're going to focus on, and I will say there will be a lot more information that actually come out of this trial, uh, including two-year follow-up. But the initial analysis is in the center where you can see all of the patients were carriers. 
So these would be the people that would be expected to have increased events with clopidogrel. And there's 903 patients that then uh, were on uh, clopidogrel and 946 patients that were on uh, ticagrelor. So we're going to focus the results which were presented at the ACC on this patient population in the middle. Next slide. And what you see is this, and, and I think it's a really interesting, uh, you know, this trial is important from also from a standpoint of, uh, of uh, how we interpret trials. So if you look at the conventional in, in uh, blue, which is clopidogrel, and you look at the uh, ticagulor uh, in uh, treated patients, you'll see that at the end of one year, the p-value was 0.056. But clearly, there's a significant, you know, there was a change quickly. Um, and now I will also point out that the overall event rates, even in clopidogrel, in patients who actually carry the allele and therefore are, are quote, uh, clopidogrel poor responders, the combined endpoint at one year was only uh, about 5% and compared to about 3% in the uh, uh, ticagular treated arms. Um, but next, why don't we go to the next slide? You will see that at 30 days, there was a significant reduction in the combined endpoint in the patients treated with ticagular. Now, that stayed relatively parallel, but because of the numbers and because of the num small number of events, it was just a borderline significance out to uh, at one year. But I do think this is compelling, and I, I think it, it, it shows you that it, with moderate technology, both acute coronary syndrome and with uh, the new uh, generation stints that we have and better technique that we're using, that really, look at the event rates at 90 days if you're on an appropriate antiplatelet. They're really uh, darn near close to zero. So I think, um, you know, I think number one, this trial is a comment on uh, how amazingly uh, good the outcomes are after PCI in the world today. And remember, this was the international uh, multicenter trial. Next slide. Another really important point was if uh, the other analysis that I showed you was time to first event. But if you actually looked at cumulative events, and I would argue that cumulative events is really uh, uh, more important because you, it, you want to know the total number of events in the group. And then you can actually see not only was that early separation at 90 days, but there was a continued more separation such that um, by one year, uh, there was a significant reduction. It was, P, uh, it was uh, 0.01, and the hazard ratio was about 0.6. So um, I do think that, uh, you know, and then the total number of event rates still, uh, even though we're now taking cumulative events, you're still under 7% total for conventional therapy, and you're about 4% for those who are uh, genotype-guided uh, therapy. Next slide. So I think the conclusion of the trial was that when you looked at, uh, when you compared a conventional clopidogrel therapy, without point of care genotyping in, in patients with both acute coronary syndrome and stable uh, coronary disease undergoing PCI, there was quote, no significant difference. But it was certainly, uh, I would say, um, definitely significant at three months, definitely significant with multiple events, and uh, certainly borderline uh, with a p-value of 0.056. And so, uh, the, I think really um, the potential of genotype guided therapy is is real, um, and it actually makes me think twice about doing it. And I think uh, from from my perspective, it depends on how inexpensive it is uh, and what the risk of the patients are. But if it was um, very inexpensive and could be done quickly, it seems to me that this would be a, a good thing to number one, both assure you. Uh, patients who clopidogrel is good enough, uh, 
and then target those patients who carry the allele uh, to really consider a more potent uh, P2Y12 inhibitor. I didn't show these data, but I can tell you that the bleeding rates were similar between the two strategies, no difference at, at all, and extremely low. So again, uh, um, a testimony to how outstanding PCI is in the world today, uh, number one. Uh, and then the last point is that, um, that NHL BI funding is uh, uh, ongoing and it'll be it'll go for it uh, out to two years. And then we will have a lot more information. So the initial analysis that was presented was really with the uh, just the patients that ha that carry the allele and about 1,800. But remember, over 5,000 patients were randomized. So there's more to come from the Taylor PCI trial. But I do think a very well done trial um, and really the best information that tells us about genotyping. Next slide. I think that's it. So there you are, Ramesh. I, what, how, how would you interpret these results? Yeah, Tim, this is actually very interesting. And, uh, you know, I, I, I think uh, many of the people feel that uh, whether there is a truly greater benefit uh, with the Ticagrelor. And I think there is in this particular group, we don't have to depend upon uh, uh, genetic testing. And uh, uh, it is not easy to do genetic testing in uh, countries, uh, several places like in India. And even in the United States, I don't think each and every facility here has the capability of doing genetic testing. So, I mean, definitely, I still stick to using uh, uh, Ticagrelor in many of the patients, but uh, obviously clopidogrel in this trial has been shown that it is not that uh, bad. And uh, um, so whether uh, the other question also I was going to ask you is, uh, what do you think about clopidogrel monotherapy versus Ticagrelor monotherapy? Yeah, okay, so this is a really, really great question. Uh, and I think this is uh, comes from the Twilight trial. For so for people out there, the Twilight trial was just presented uh, uh, last year at the American Heart Association and at, at TCT. And what the Twilight trial did was, after three months of dual antiplatelet therapy for patients who had not had bleeding and who had not had ischemic events, they stopped the aspirin. And when they did that, what you saw is in the twilight trial that there was no difference in ischemic events, so it was safe to stop the aspirin. And more importantly, there was a significant decrease in bleeding. So I think that if, if you have a standard patient and you have them on aspirin and ticagrelor at three months, it's actually pretty rational to stop the aspirin. Now, the problem is, we don't know what to do then at one year. At one year, do you uh, restart the aspirin and stop the ticagrelor? Do you continue the ticagrelor? That's really an unknown question. But a really more important question is this. Is there a class effect? And so if you're on aspirin and prasugrel, for example, could you stop the aspirin? I think it's possible that you could. Uh, uh, because I think uh, Prasugrel and Ticagrelor are more like each other. But I think it's very, I would be very worried. In fact, I would not do it if you're on Clopidogrel and stopping the aspirin at uh, three months. There's no data with that at all. Yeah. And I think if you look, it's, it potentially is dangerous. And I think this trial points that out because there's definitely carriers – uh, there's patients who are less clopidogrel responsive. So I think if you're using clopidogrel, I would stick to both aspirin and clopidogrel. Does that make, would you agree with that? Yes, I agree. And one more question is non-carriers uh, versus uh, ticagrelor, uh, person from Indian colleagues. So they didn't show us from this trial, but I think we could expect that non-carriers would have uh, really excellent results with clopidogrel, uh, and that would be preferred and it's uh, inexpensive. Yes. And uh, did you think uh, this trial actually addressed uh, uh, heterozygosities of the carriers or it's mostly brilliant or was given for homozygous carriers? So that's a good question. I we I don't have uh, so they might have that data. I'm sure that they do. But I 
I don't know it yet. I mean, I because it just got presented, um, you know, just a month ago. Uh, and I'm not, I don't know the details of the different genetic, uh, uh, phen- uh, the de- different genotypes. Because they're definitely, it's a very complicated thing when you do genome. There's multiple different alleles. Um, and I think mo- most of people know out there that it is quite complicated. Um, so, it, it, again, there's a lot more to come from this trial. and We'll learn a lot more. But, um, I, and I still, I think one of the most more important take home points is how remarkably well all the patients did in both arms and that they had to actually repower and do more patients because the event rates were so low. So that's a testimony to successful PCI uh, in the world today. Thank you very much, Tim. And I think uh, uh, I'll ask uh, Dr. Cindy Grimes now to join us. And uh, before that, a few questions about my study in the UK. I mean, uh, the study I presented on UK TAVI did not look at the embolic protection, did not actually uh, include big tool for valve and valve. Uh, it was primarily done um, as a, 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 a de novo iotic stenosis. And the other question was if somebody which rightfully commented uh, from India is saying that the other way to look at it is uh, Surgery is non-inferior even in the elderly and uh, higher risk patients. And what do you think about that, Tim? In UK TAVI trial, surgery was non-inferior to uh, to you know, to the uh, to Sir TAVI. Tim, I think you're muted, so I, I, maybe you did not hear me. Can you say that again? Sorry about that. So in UK TAVI trial, uh, yeah. if you play devil's advocate and you say that uh, surgery is not that bad, why are we even pushing TAVI? Yeah, I think, so it's a good question. I mean, I first of all, I was not surprised by the results either. Uh, I agree with Sunil. Um, and I think um, it, uh, this comes down to patient preference. And uh, I think that especially that um, most patients, if they, had their choice, choose the less invasive and less time in the hospital. So I think that's really the issue. Um, but you you are right that surgery is um, not a bad choice. Yeah. It's just that it. I think TAVI is uh, straightforward, easy. You're in the hospital most places for you know 24 hours and uh, have outstanding results. Yeah, I and think. Uh, right? Yeah, I agree. I agree. And uh, so the other question was TAVI in paravalvular leak. It doesn't work. And in fact, I don't think in a surgical AVR or bioprosthetic paravalvular leak has to be closed with uh, some sort of plug. Uh, we use uh, uh, Amplax or vascular plug tools in, uh, or fours in those uh, varieties. Yeah. Okay. So that's, I think, uh, that's it for now. And uh, thank you very much, Tim. I appreciate your time. And uh, we'll move on to please stay on the panel after the end of the Cindy's uh, discussion. Yeah, I'll stay here. Thank you. Please let us know when Dr. Grimes is ready. And uh, I'll answer a couple of questions with that. You know, back to you, Tim. Uh, we are going to have a COVID uh, Sky webinar next week. And uh, But one of the questions that was asked is about. Uh, would we do primary in COVID positive patients? And uh, it is pre- really a difficult question. And uh, we are trying, you know, if it is a truly COVID positive and it's a real STEMI, number one. Uh, there are lots of uh, pathology specimens that are being done in the, in New York State and in, in my previous uh, hospital at NYU Winthrop, where they were not able to show that there is uh, epicardial uh, vessel thrombosis. So you have to make sure that it is not a takosubo or uh, uh, some sort of myocarditis. So if it is truly a STEMI and if it is COVID positive patient, uh, you have to make sure that there is enough PPE to support, to cover yourself up. And uh, we actually have a protocol here. We give thrombolytics for those patients. If they really don't resolve uh, STs and uh, if the patient is still having more chest pain, we electively intubate them in the negative pressure room, then take them to the cath lab and uh, do the uh, cardiac catheterization. Because without intubation, if he you know, you know, vomits or, uh, uh, or coughs in the cath lab, that is going to be a disaster. You're exposing a lot of for your staff, and the infection rate is about 
for all healthcare workers. Tim, do you do STEMIs in COVID positive patients? Yeah, no, this is a really interesting topic, co topic and uh, uh, somewhat controversial, but I'll tell you what I think are guidelines, uh, the um, American College of Cardiology, uh, SKY, and uh, American College of Emergency Physicians have really uh, put together a position statement that will be coming out shortly. Um, but here's my take about this. I think primary PCI is the preferred treatment for patients with ST elevation of mind. And I think we should do best care for our patients. And I think that um, if you look at uh, what's happened, there's a, a number of things that are uh, clear about COVID. Number one, patients with cardiovascular disease are at higher risk for bad outcomes. Number two, uh, COVID uh, patients do have cardiovascular manifestations. So uh, in particular, there is a, appears to be an increased thrombotic uh, events, both um, our arterial thrombosis as well as uh, pulmonary emboli. In addition, there's myocarditis. Uh, and so there is um, what an increase in what we call STEMI mimics. So patients who have myocarditis but ST elevation, and patients that have on uh, Um, So uh, I think those are important points to be aware of. Then a third important thing that's happened around, not only just in the United States, but around the world, is that there's uh, a decrease in STEMI volume, that we've seen a decrease in STEMI volume. So uh, both in Spain and in the United States, we, we published a paper last week that showed there's a 40% reduction in STEMI uh, STEMI activations. Well, we all know there's no reason why STEMI, you, you would expect an increase in number of STEMIs. So what this reflects is patients being scared to go to the hospital. And what we've seen is an increased late presentation, so complications of STEMI, and we've seen uh, increase in uh, um, uh, auto-hospital cardiac arrest. So I think number one, we need to tell our patients Come to, it's safe to come to the hospital. If you're having chest pain, you're having shortness of breath, you should call 911 and come to the hospital, just like before. Second thing, uh, I think that the preferred thing is, um, and again, it depends a little bit on where you are and what your resources are. But uh, for example, uh, last night at our hospital, we had a COVID positive patient that presented with an anterior ST elevation. And uh, we safely, uh, using good uh, personal protective equipment, uh, did a PCI. Uh, and patient had a very severe, uh, you know, a proximal LED occlusion that was fixed. And so I, I think right now that the preferred choice is that. The problem with Lytics is this. Uh, and uh, for those of you who know, I am uh, have been always a lytic pro, uh, a proponent for patients who are going to be treated in greater than 120 minutes. So the regional STEMI systems that I'm part of uh, for patients for non-PCI centers that are long distance away, we've always used uh, um, we happen to use half dose, but we use uh, uh, a pharmacoinvasive approach. So I, I'm not a Antilytics, but I think if anything in the current era with COVID, lytics are even less advantageous because you have this increased STEMI mimics. So if you give a uh, patient has ST elevation and shortness of breath, and you give them lytics, it's you know lytics are not going to change the ST elevation for Takasubus or or myocarditis. And so you're going to still end up in the cath lab anyway. And now you've exposed the patient to risks and not. So I, I'm not a proponent of it. And I think that uh, uh, when we put together and tried to get guidelines and approach of it, I think that the best approach is to do best care, which is primary PCI, but safely. And then I think another important point is it is worth the time to um, evaluate the person in the emergency room, think about the symptoms. Uh, if a point of care ultrasound is available, uh, look at that. So I think a, uh, a step back and a five or 10 minute evaluation of all of things so that you're prepared when you go to the cath lab is prudent.
And I think if your patient has diffuse ST elevation and has an echo that shows global or only mild or, or normal function, then you might consider not going to cath lab at all um, because that's uh, if you think it's more likely a myocarditis or a STEMI mimic. Is that helpful? Yeah, that's very helpful, uh, Tim. I think, uh, as you know, that uh, in China, they uh, wore about four layers of protective coverage for people who are truly uh, uh, COVID positive. They had to be taken to the cath lab. And uh, even in the United States, I don't think we have that sort of uh, right. knowledge and we never use that, that similar PPE. Uh, China is advantageous because they had experience with the COVID and the uh, uh, coronavirus in the past in 2003 and then 2009. And we are just uh, getting on it. And I think, uh, you know, that is uh, an issue, as you said, if it is truly a STEMI, uh, you know, if you have the proper PPE, uh, taking them to the cap lab at least will address if it is Takosubo or if it is a truly, a, uh, you know, an occlusive lesion. So uh, Dr. Grimes, I, uh, please let me know if she's ready. Cindy's ready to go. <laughs> Good morning, Cindy. Good, Good morning. morning, how are you? Good. Very good, Cindy. Please go ahead and uh, you know uh, do your case presentation. Then we'll have a discussion on uh, all the possibilities. Thank you. So, Ramesh, I don't hear you. So, just uh, tell me. Somebody could just tell me when to start. Okay. Well, I guess I'm starting. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Sorry about the technical difficulties on my end. Uh, but today I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, PCI in the patient with chronic kidney disease. And we're going to uh, have a case presentation as well as review some of the data from um, uh, the ischemia CKD trial. Uh, next slide. So we'll just start with, uh, I have no disclosures re relative to this um, presentation. But uh, this is a, an actual case of a 79-year-old male who was referred via email from India. And that's why I chose this case. Um, this is an elderly gentleman, 79, with class 3 angina, despite being on calcium blockers and nitrates. And he's approximately uh, uh, two to three months after he had a non-STEMI. Unfortunately, the patient has multiple comorbidities, including COPD, peripheral vascular disease, as well as a prior TIA, which was treated with a carotid stent. So clearly the patient is going to have a high STS score. Um, and uh, he incidentally has a low gradient, uh, about a 15 millimeter gradient aortic stenosis with low flow. And so we're not quite sure whether this is real aortic stenosis or whether it's just the low flow uh, creating a pseudoaortic stenosis. And he has a depressed ejection fraction between 25 and 30%. So this uh, Ramesh, perhaps we can discuss this uh, during the, a later time. Uh, he underwent chest CT for dyspnea and uh, they thought it might've been a pulmonary issue. And incidentally, it showed that all the coronary arteries were heavily calcified. Uh, so he uh, was then referred for uh, potential cardiac catheterization and, in, and uh, intervention. But unfortunately, his laboratories demonstrated a BUN of 35, a creatinine of 2.0, and the GFR was not calculated. But as you know, we can sort of estimate this uh, based on the fact that he's a 79-year-old person, uh, as well as in general, um, Indians are not morbidly obese like they are in the United States. So I'm assuming that his GFR would be quite low. And incidentally, uh, as seen in many patients with uh, chronic kidney disease, has, he has a very low baseline hemoglobin of 8 and a hematocrit of 25. So all of these things taken together put, place him at relatively high risk of, of doing anything, of doing a cardiac catheterization. Unfortunately, if we do a cath, often in these patients with severe chronic kidney disease, they ask us not to use the radial because they want to save that for future um, hemodialysis sites. So then we're stuck using the femoral approach if we do a catheterization. He's already at very high risk of bleeding, at very high risk of developing a, a further renal failure with the contrast. And so we don't really know what to do with this patient. And uh, I think it'd be interesting at a later time to discuss what exactly is the best management for this particular individual. Next slide. And that as a backdrop, I think we can go into uh, the um, 
ischemia CKD trials. And this was uh, uh, just recently published and presented at the ACC. And doc Dr. Bangalore uh, looked at both the clinical as well as the quality of life outcomes across a spectrum of baseline kidney function. Next slide. And as you may be aware, uh, chronic kidney disease patients are underrepresented in uh, revascularization trials. In fact, if one goes back to the COURAGE trial, there were only 16 patients who had a low GFR below 30. In the Berry 2 d trial, patients with a serum creatinine of greater than two would have been excluded. And even in the FAME trial, there were only 20 patients who had a creatinine of uh, greater than two. And so we don't really have a lot of data on this particular um, um, clinical situation. And as many of you in the audience know, if I refer to a case that has really severe renal insufficiency or is on dialysis, I'm not too thrilled about taking those patients to the cath lab because I know it's going to be a difficult case. And if they're not on pre-existing dialysis often, I can send them into profound renal failure. And so uh, it'd be important to find out how to best manage these patients. Next slide. Now, this is just an algorithm showing the ischemia trial as well as the ischemia CKD trial. And uh, uh, what you can see in this uh, algorithm is a, a couple things. I think it's important to uh, point out that, excuse me, uh, in the ischemia trial, they took pa uh, stable patients with moderate or severe ischemia. And interestingly, in this trial, they recommended doing a blinded CTA if you uh, did not already know the patient's anatomy. Conversely, in the ischemia CKD trial, they did not have any uh, pretreatment with the CTA. So going into the CKD arm, we had no idea what's the, what the patient's coronary anatomy is. And then uh, it, the patients were just randomized on the basis of uh, having what they thought was severe ischemia on the, a stress test, as well as a low GFR of less than 30 or on dialysis. And there is no, as best I can tell, there was really no uh, pre um, requirement to have angina. And that'll uh, come in importantly later. But these patients who ended up in the stress lab for whatever reason and had an abnormal stress test were then randomized if they had a low GFR to receive either an invasive strategy where they underwent catheterization and revascularization versus a conservative strategy where they received medical therapies alone. And then the primary endpoint was a composite of death or acute MI. Now, I'd like to point out a couple things on this rather than because I don't have slides on it, but there was about 777 patients who were randomized in the CKD arm. And uh, the duration of follow-up was about 2.3 years. And interestingly, 57% of these patients had underlying diabetes. So these patients are, are quite sick to begin with. The other thing I'd like to point out is even though patients are randomized to receive about 330, so were randomized to the invasive arm, interestingly, about 80, only 85% of them had a car cardiac catheterization, and only 50% of them underwent revascularization. And if one looks at the reasons, the number one reason for not undergoing revascularization is uh, e the patient either refused or died prior to undergoing the invasive strategy. So unfortunately, it would be great if we had... Uh, if we knew more details about this, and specifically if, if there was an analysis of intention to treat rather than, uh, um, excuse me, a, an analysis based on treatment received rather, rather than intention to treat. Next slide. Um, what uh, Bangalore did is uh, he included the, in this initial analysis, he included the patients in the CKD arm, which was stage four and stage five, patients, but he com combined them actually with the overall ischemia trial, which was stage one, stage two, stage three. So basically, we have five different categories based on the uh, patient's baseline GFR to look at. Next slide. And what you can see is that, as you might suspect, the CKD stage really influenced uh, the outcomes. And the uh, primary endpoint in this trial, which was death and myocardial infarction, um, 
Um, you can see that it, if you look at all comers, all patients were enrolled in both ischemia, the first three bars, as well as ischemia CKD, that's the uh, last two bars. There was a, a, a big difference based on, on the patient's baseline GFR. And so you can see as the GFR decreased, there was an uh, increase in the risk of all calls mortality. And in, in the CKD arm, it was about 2.3 years um, mean follow-up. In addition, there was an increase in the risk of myocardial infarction. Um, and these were significant differences uh, based on the underlying GFR at the beginning of the trial. So we all know that patients with CKD have worse outcomes. That's been shown time and time and time again. And we can see that uh, that reflected here in the ischemia CKD trial. Next slide. In addition to death and MI, there are a number of other uh, things that happen in patients with uh, CKD. And this, again, is looking at uh, all comers again, uh, the patient based on the stage one to stage five. Surprisingly, mortality uh, uh, went up in uh, the stage four, but did not wasn't quite as high in the stage five. And the risk of stroke didn't seem to differ that much in these patients because it was an infrequent occurrence. But as you might expect, acute kidney injury uh, varied quite a bit based on uh, the underlying um, situation. And the, the stage five, many of those patients were on dialysis, but some of them were not on dialysis. It was a GFR of less than 15. And some of those went on to develop acute kidney injury or dialysis. And then uh, interestingly, uh, we've known this from other studies, but the bleeding complications increase based on the underlying GFR. So as seen in many other situations, uh, patients at uh, increased risk of ischemic events, increased risk of MI or death, are also at increased risk of bleeding. And this sort of complicates our ability to manage those patients. Next slide. If you look at uh, uh, this uh, uh, slide now, we have an issue with uh, um, uh, heterogeneity of uh, treatment. And let me just pull this up on my computer so I can see it a little bit better. But as I'm, uh, the overall endpoint of death or MI really didn't uh, differ between patients who are now randomized to invasive versus non-invasive. So there's no overall difference in death or MI, but there's, uh, it's seen in the just the original ischemia trial and the patients without chronic kidney disease, they found an increased risk of procedural MI, uh, but a decreased risk of non-procedural MI. And you can see this uh, here as well. And uh, uh, if you have stage one or two chronic kidney disease, uh, at the time of uh, the PCI, there was a significant increased risk of having a paraprocedural MI. And uh, basically, if you uh, follow that down, uh, you, what you see is that it really uh, holds true over all five stages. And so uh, what you see is that paraprocedural MIs become more common with uh, with an invasive arm. It's just not significant because there are probably fewer patients in the chronic kidney uh, stage four and stage five. On the other hand, the non-procedural MIs are less. And if you follow these patients out to the 2.3 or three years uh, uh, mean follow-up, what the spontaneous MIs, the more important MIs, are actually less with the patients who receive the interventional treatment. And this is consistent, again, among all uh, stages of chronic kidney disease. Next slide. And if you look, at, this is interesting, if you look at the risk of stroke, uh, there was a slight increase uh, risk of stroke overall in patients who underwent uh, the invasive procedures. And I have not seen this broken down into whether these strokes are occurring early or late or whether these are paraprocedural strokes due to bypass surgery. But uh, uh, is you, it, when you get into the patients with a higher risk of chronic kidney disease, you see those strokes are occurring more frequently. The odds ratios are much higher, five and three times increased risk of stroke if you have um, an invasive strategy. So clearly that's not a good signal to taking these patients to the cardiac catheterization laboratory. 
And then if you look at the uh, combined endpoint of death or new dialysis, you can see it is slightly higher in those patients with uh, stage four chronic kidney disease. Did not see this in patients with stage five, and that's possibly uh, due to the fact that some of those patients were already on dialysis. But the, be that as it may, it, it's not uh, favorable outcomes in patients with chronic kidney disease, severe chronic kidney disease that were taken to the cath lab. Next slide. Now let's look at uh, Seattle Angina um, questionnaires. What you see in the first slide is that three months, there appears to be a benefit with regard to reduction in angina, but that's primarily occurring in the patients who have the higher GFRs. And if you get down into the very low GFR in the range of 15 or so, we're not seeing any benefit at three months, 12 months, or 36 months. So despite uh, doing these high-risk procedures, it does not appear to be benefiting patients from angina. But this is a, a bit of a problem with the ischemia trial in, in, in general. And uh, what was found on the baseline Seattle Angina questionnaire 50% of these patients who were enrolled in the CKD trial really didn't have angina at baseline. And the ones that did have uh, angina baseline typically were having it infrequently. And so if you can look at those uh, patients who had daily or weekly angina, you can see that there was a benefit really from uh, getting PCI. And uh, if patients had only monthly angina, there was a benefit of PCI, but it tended to go away in, uh, when they had the low GFRs. And among that group of 50% who had no angina on the questionnaire at baseline, of course, you can't expect to see any benefit. So my interpretation of this is that we can reduce uh, angina frequency uh, if the patient has baseline angina. So the conclusion from this trial is that there's really an exponential increase in cardiovascular events. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, there's an exponential increase in event rate in patients with a lower kidney function. And I think we've known this uh, in the past, but this just drives home how uh, difficult these patients are. And about 30% of them are actually going to be dead at, at the mean follow-up of 2.3 years. Uh, there are procedural-related complications and bleeding complications that are really quite increased with lower kidney function. And there is really no evidence of a meaningful treatment effect for clinical outcomes uh, across the GFR spectrum, but specifically in uh, patients who had um, the uh, low GFR. And specifically, if, uh, primary and uh, major secondary outcomes were really no different. That was similar to the overall ischemia trial and that uh, there was a reduction in um, spontaneous MIs among patients uh, who, next slide, please, uh, with regard to uh, the heterogeneity of uh, treatment effect, there is an increased risk of death with very, very high uh, uh, CKD stage four uh, and an increased risk of stroke in those patients with uh, CKD stage four and stage five. And again, I don't know exactly when those deaths are occurring. As I mentioned before, some of those deaths uh, the number one reason that those patients did not undergo cath is because they died before the procedure was done. And so I think we need to see more information on this. Uh, how many of these were pre-treatment? How many of those were um, uh, during uh, the procedure or at later follow-up? And we can get a better understanding when those data become available. And with regard to improving angina, uh, there was really no overall benefit with regard to proving angina in those patients with chronic kidney disease. But the problem was that the majority, 50% of these patients had almost no symptoms. And if one uh, isolated this to the patient with frequent angina, there did appear to be a benefit. Thank you very much. Any questions? I think uh, uh, it's a very good uh, study. It's really amazing that uh, this is something that nobody has done. And now we have ischemia CKD trial because most, as you said, most of the studies actually did not include uh, CKD patients. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think uh, uh, there are some questions that are coming up, uh, but uh, let me ask you a few questions which have come uh, with uh, for Tim as well. And uh, uh, oh, Tim, thank you very much uh, still being on, on, on online. So questions about, uh, isn't aspirin most uh, cost effective than uh, 
especially in the countries like India, compared to other agents, or do you think uh, uh, aspirin alone would be enough? I think uh, you know there has been a lot of evidence that uh, um, the aspirin causes more GI bleed, and uh, there is definitely uh, even the Capri has shown that the clopidogrel on top of aspirin is better than aspirin alone. So. I don't think that uh, even though it is very cost effective, but I don't think the event rates are uh, lower with the uh, aspirin uh, from in terms of GI bleed. If we use uh, monotherapy with the uh, ticagrel or it's uh, superior than actually uh, aspirin uh, alone. Um, can you comment about topic study which switching from uh, ticagrel or to clopidogrel, Tim? You know, one, three months off or one month of uh, aspirin and uh, ticagrelor and then switching to aspirin and clopidogrel. Yeah, you know, I think with, with uh, chronic kidney disease, I, I'm not sure we know the optimal antiplatelet. I think that's part of the problem is the patients haven't been studied as much. Uh, and I think in a uh, great job, Cindy, I, and I think um, – it really shows again, like it's overall with ischemia, that it tracks very quickly, uh, very closely. But I do think that uh, it's whereas overall outcomes we saw in both ischemia and in um, Taylor PCI are extremely low. The really high. Uh, Chronic kidney diseases, especially class four and five, are a high risk patient population, and I and we almost need to study them directly because um, and these patients are at high events for PCI, and they're also at high event for if you do cabbage. So I will tell you, taking care of a lot of dialysis patients and uh, for a long time, it's a really challenging patient population. They have extensive calcification, so that we almost need to do study that are designed specifically for them because we need to do, have better outcomes for sure. Mm -hmm. I agree. And uh, one thing I didn't point out is, remember only 15% of the patients randomized to uh, the invasive arm never got a diagnostic care. And uh, then another 27% of the patients who did have a diagnostic cath had no obstructive coronary disease. And so now we're talking about 45% of the population. Uh, and so it's, it's a very difficult study because you don't know how to interpret that. And that's not really how we would manage patients in clinical practice. I think, first of all, we'd be inclined to take patients to the cath lab who had angina, at least, angina with an abnormal stress test or unstable angina. And then once you get in there and define the coronary anatomy, I think you might uh, do a better job of uh, determining the management strategy. And so unfortunately, this trial was not designed like that. So we're still left with a lot of questions. So that was one of the questions, Cindy, they asked actually, uh, a patient in CCU undergoing dialysis for the first time, creatinine 5.9 and having angina, you would take them to the cath lab, won't you? Yeah, I probably would. But uh, again, a lot of these patients could have angina due to a number of different reasons. The case presentation I uh, showed you had a very low hemoglobin. And sometimes uh, patients have uh, angina due to a low hemoglobin, and they might have hypertension or hypotension uh, during the dialysis. And so that still doesn't tell us whether the patient is going to have severe um, coronary disease, but I think it's worthwhile defining the coronary anatomy. And then you can use the heart team approach. If the patient has multivessel disease, then you can use the heart team approach to figure out the best way to manage them. Now, Tim mentioned that they have high complications from bypass, which is true. In fact, uh, we're so worried about developing uh, worsening kidney disease if we take the patients to the cath lab, but the data show that they're much more likely to develop uh, dialysis dependence after bypass surgery compared to uh, undergoing a cath lab procedure. Yeah, well, so one last question is actually, how long do you think after PCI in uh, people with dialysis, would you continue antiplatelets? And what uh, antiplatelet would you recommend? No, I would probably recommend a stronger agent. Uh, you know, I'm a, a proponent for using tricagrelor. I guess I uh, to actually prosagrel in the acute patients, but these are stable patients that I'm talking about now, stable angina. 
but I like Tim's approach of uh, starting them on ticagrelor and maybe dropping the aspirin. And the I interesting thing is in your uh, study, Tim, it looked like you had about 40% of those patients had um, uh, abnormalities in their genetic testing overall. And I have seen other studies that show 30%. So say, for example, if you don't have um, ability to do genetic testing or you need to make this decision quickly, right? You can't, when you're doing the PCI, it's not like you can wait for those genetic tests to come back. And so in my practice, I've been using a stronger agent like ticagrelor for the first month or two. And Tim, in your study, it looked like the divergence of the curves really occurred quite dramatically in the first couple of months. Afterwards, uh, it was a parallel. And so what do you think about a strategy where any high-risk patient gets ticagrelor um, at least for the first couple of months? I'm not sure whether Tim is here, but uh, that okay. I completely agree with you. I, uh, there's, uh, I think, a stronger antiplatelet agent at least for up to three months, and then maybe switching to a less potent is all right. And uh, I think uh, uh, one of the questions that uh, we have to wrap up soon, but uh, there's a question about uh, aspirin, clopidogrel, ticagrelor for GI bleeding patients. Which one do you think is the least uh, offensive agent? <laughs> for GI bleeding, well, mm -hmm. unfortunately, anything can bleed. But as uh, I mentioned before from the uh, pre-trial, I think it was, they, where they compared aspirin to uh, clopidogrel, mm -hmm. what they found is that there was a higher incidence of GI bleeding with aspirin. And we know that. I mean, it causes gastric irritation. And so I would definitely get rid of the aspirin and give uh, – uh, it, in the setting of GI bleeding, I probably would go with clopidogrel just because it's a little bit – it's not as strong as ticagrelor. Yes, I agree. Thank you very much, uh, Cindy. And I want to thank again Sun Pharma and all the cardiologists from India who have joined us. Uh, this is really a very successful uh, webinar that we had. And please uh, uh, also follow us on the next one, which would be strictly to COVID and uh, cardiac disease and COVID patients. Uh, and especially in India now, the COVID incidence is climbing up. And uh, we want you to gain as much knowledge or advice from our uh, colleagues who have uh, really were in the forefront uh, in, uh, in New York and other parts of the United States. And uh, with that, uh, we really uh, appreciate. And one last slide, I think, uh, from Eric. Um, are you planning to end? So that's the last slide. Uh, look at that, please. And uh, on uh, make yourself available on uh, Tuesday, April 21st from uh, 6.30 to 8 p.m. Indian Standard Time. And uh, this will be a latest uh, sky guide, uh, guidance and the real world experience, and as I mentioned. And uh, once again, thank you very much for all of us to join, uh, for all of you to join us and uh, maintain social distancing, be safe. Uh, this is a very crucial period that all of us have to participate in social distancing. And I think uh, India has been doing a fantastic job. Thank you very much.